I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is California's likely next attorney general. Well, Rob, they, uh, they raised the next attorney general of California. Real? Real, man. Thank you, brother. In his very first interview since that announcement, we go one-on-one -on -one with Rob Bonta. We learn his unconventional backstory, and he weighs in on how to confront anti-Asian hate. Plus, Dave Roberts. That's for it. Strike three. Dodgers have won it all in 2020. Baseball is back next week, and for the first time since 2019, fans will be in the stands in California ballparks. Bill Plaschke of the LA Times joined us to talk about the cultural, psychological, and political importance of sports, as the issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. Welcome to The Issue Is. This week, Governor Newsom made one of the most consequential decisions he'll ever make in office when announcing his pick for California Attorney General. His pick is Rob Bonta. He is our guest this week. If approved by the legislature, he'll be in the second most influential job in America's most populous state. Bonta, seen here with his mom this week, would be the first Filipino American in a position that is often a stepping stone for even bigger jobs. The most important positions, not just in the state, arguably in the United States. Let's take a moment to look at the last three attorneys general from California. Jerry Brown, in the job from 2007 to 2011, went on to return as California's governor for two terms. He'd be replaced as AG by Kamala Harris, who, of course, became California's senator and now the vice president of the United States. She'd be replaced as AG by Javier Becerra, who is now the United States Secretary of Health and Human Services. In fact, this week, quite the California moment here, when California's last two AGs participated in Becerra's swearing-in ceremony. Rob Bonta is Governor Newsom's choice to replace Javier Becerra. He's currently a Democratic Assemblyman representing Oakland, and he's a married father of three. Rob Bonta, welcome to The Issue Is for the first time. Thank you, Alex. I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me. After that intro, what job are you going for after this one? No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you don't have to say that. Let's start uh, with the question uh, that I ask every candidate who's going for a job, and we appreciate this is the first interview you've done since being named into this role. Why do you want this job? I want to uh, make uh, the fights of everyday people my fights and be their champion, uh, fight for them, do more justice, uh, help people, and solve problems. I think we should get to know you a little bit. A lot of folks watching on our station, KTVU in the Bay Area, very familiar with your work, but people watching on some of our other stations are just learning about you this week. Let's talk for a moment about your background. It's quite a story, your childhood. You were born in the Philippines, but you came here as a baby. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, my parents, both lifelong social justice advocates and activists, um, my parents were working in the Philippines as missionaries serving people, helping others. Um, and when I was born, I was born in Quezon City, uh, Philippines, and um, Ferdinand Marcos was the president at the time. He was inching ever closer to his uh, now infamous declaration of martial law. And when I was two months old, my parents uh, moved to California and specifically to a very special place called La Paz, the headquarters of the United Farm Workers of America movement outside of Bakersfield in the Tehachapi Mountains. And they can continued their service, their activism, their fight for social justice as farm worker organizers with the United Farm Workers of America. And of course, the leaders of that organization, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, you actually lived in a trailer very close to Cesar Chavez. And as an adult, you've worked very closely with Dolores Huerta. What did they do to shape your worldview? I learned some deep and important lessons about equality and also about justice, that an injustice against one is an injustice against all. And, uh, it, 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 and that it was critical and important and valuable to fight for justice. And this week, when Governor Newsom made the big announcement, your mom was on hand for that. We have a photo of you with your mom after that. And I thought a lot about this journey that your mom must have been on to go to escape political oppression in the Philippines, to come here, to live literally in a trailer, and then to have this moment this week where she watched her son be nominated as the attorney general of the state. What did she say to you in that moment? She said to me what she says to me so often, um, that she loves me and that she's proud of me. 
And that has been a fuel for me and uh, 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 an anchor and foundation of support. Um, you know, speaking of her journey, she, she was on a journey for three weeks on a boat from the Philippines uh, to California when she stepped on you know, American soil for the first time at 28 years old as an immigrant. She uh, fought for farm worker rights, as you said, in a trailer. She worked in the, in the preschool there with uh, Dolores Huerta while my dad was in the front office with Cesar Chavez. She continued to fight against the declaration of, of martial law and uh, the, the oppressive rule of Ferdinand Marcos for years until the People Power Revolution of 1986. And she was a lawful permanent resident, resident in this country for decades until 2010, when I had my first competitive election for city council in my hometown of Alameda, and she became a citizen so she could vote for me. Wow. So my mom has been my biggest supporter um, and my biggest inspiration for as long as I can remember. Uh, as a mama's boy, I, I love hearing that. <laughs> you would, uh, of course, uh, be the first Filipino American Attorney General at a time when anti-Asian hate is really in the news. You talked about this a lot during your announcement this week. In that job, as being the chief law enforcement officer in the state of California, what is your specific plan to punish anti-Asian hate? Well, it, it, it's multidimensional. And let me just first say that the Asian American community, uh, and I know this from lived experience, from personal experience, uh, as a member of the API community, is in a state of crisis right now. It's a full-on state of emergency. Uh, we had once seen individuals you know, spit on and yelled at, uh, later pushed down and punched in the face and assaulted, and now uh, being murdered. And so it is really important for the, uh, the people's attorney, the chief uh, law officer of the state of California, to see and value our API community and to care, uh, and also to take action. So and there are important steps that we can take, including um, getting an a, a anti-hate uh, hotline uh, that's up and running. But the most important thing is to prioritize uh, and to care and to see these attacks in our community and be committed uh, to taking action. Well, we're glad to hear that not only you, but the entire Bonta family is passionate about this issue, including your dog. So uh, we, <laughs> we, we appreciate his dog uh, passion. Yeah. Um, uh uh, you know, as a member of the assembly, you championed um, a, a proposition to eliminate cash bail in California, and voters turned it down. Why were they wrong? Well, uh, I, I deeply believe in the, in the will of the voters, um, and uh, you know, listened very clearly to what they were saying. And what they, I, I believe, they were saying is that money bail is fundamentally unfair, unjust, and unsafe. Uh, but but we're not yet convinced that the replacement system put forward in the proposition and in SB 10 is the right one or the best one. To me, there's no doubt that the money bail system, cash bail, uh, is wrong, uh, is unjust, unfair, unsafe, needs to be changed. On a policy perspective, I know you've supported George Gascon, uh, who is uh, L.A. County District Attorney, who has a lot of supporters and some detractors as well, um, who feel that he's maybe gone too quickly on some of these criminal justice reform issues and wish that he didn't have such blanket well, policies. What do you well, say to some of those critics? And, and is well, what we're seeing with him something we might be seeing with you statewide? I'm my own person with my own approach. I have the values that I just set forth around uh, fighting for opportunity, equity, justice, and inclusion. And uh, I've been in the legislature for eight plus years. I think people have had the chance to see my record, see the way I operate. Uh, I listen, I collaborate, I identify solutions, I, I try to find common ground, and I will continue to do all of that. All right, let's uh, play a quick game to get to know you better. This is where we have some fun. This is called Personal Issues. We put 30 seconds on the clock. These are rapid fire questions. All right, are you ready? Yes, this is I the think hard so. Part. Okay. Probably not, but I'll do my best. <laughs> What's your favorite TV show? Oof. You're killing me on this. Uh, CNN. Okay. <laughs> favorite band or musician? <laughs> uh, Lupe Fiasco. Oh, nice. Favorite sports team? <laughs> Manchester United. Sorry to other, all the other EPL fans. Yeah, but Manchester United. He's a great soccer player in the past. Favorite sports, uh, uh, favorite meal? Oof. Um, spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> <Very nice. laughs> and one last question. Uh, you're also a father of three. 
How have your kids shaped your worldview? What have you learned from them? You know, Alex, uh, of all the titles I've had, uh, my favorite is always going to be being dad. And my, my kids are everything. I have um, three of them. Uh, they're the joy uh, of a lifetime for me, uh, Reina, Ileana, and Andres. And um, they ground me in everything I do. I, I want to help fight for and create a future uh, that I would be proud uh, for them to live in. And, you know, they have taught me that I need to do more and do better uh, to address the climate crisis and um, have informed me that I need to do more to address gun violence. And that gives me the fire to fight every day to turn those things into a reality. Love hearing that. And, and just lastly, um, tell us about your dog. <laughs> well, gosh, I mean, he's been trying to edge his way in this entire time. So yeah. um, his name is Legolas. Uh, we got him from a shelter. Uh, he's named after uh, the character from Lord of the Rings, Legolas. Uh -huh. Lego for short. And uh, he clearly likes to talk. So, uh, uh, my I, apologies for your interview, not just being of me, but of being of the two of us. You but, know what? Uh, as, some, as somebody level. else who loves to talk, you can't hold it against him. <laughs> uh, Assemblyman Rob Bonta, thanks so much, and best of luck to you in the confirmation process ahead. Thank you, Alex. It's an honor to join you. Thanks for having me. Up next, something that's really making me happy. Next week, when baseball is back, fans will be back in the stands in California ballparks. We'll talk about the significance of that and the politics of sports. One of the best known columnists in the country, Bill Plaschke, when we come back. When the Dodgers won the World Series, there were some fans in the stands because baseball moved the series to Texas. But here in California, there were only cardboard cutouts in the stands all season long. Well, now our glory days are coming back. Baseball will be the first major sport to have fans back with a whole lot of restrictions. Let's talk about the deeper meaning behind all of that with our guest this week, Bill Plaschke has won the Associated Press National Sports Columnist Award eight times. They call him Tom Brady in the press box. He is a columnist for the LA Times, well known for his years of appearances on ESPN's Around the Horn as well. Bill Plaschke, welcome to The Issue Is for the first time. Thanks, Bo. It's really, I love the, the, the song Happy you played during the tease because sports fans are getting real happy here in LA finally. Yeah, I, I'm feeling happy too. And by the way, for those around the horn fans, I have no way to mute his mic. So this, <laughs> he's got it. <laughs> Thank the right gosh. Here. Yeah. That's a first. I get to talk forever. That's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. So fans in the stands, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to this state? What does that mean to players? Well, it's huge for our city. It's just huge. Last year, the world, when Kobe Bryant passed, the world saw us grieve. And then the ensuing 12 months, nobody heard, heard us cheer. Nobody could see how we, we, we couldn't share in the joy. Two, we won two championships last year in a 16-day span. And, nobody, and, it, and, and we, we missed it. The fans missed it. L.A. missed it. There was no uh, I love L.A. There was no seventh inning stretch. There was no parade. There was no standing ovation. There was no hugs of your the guy sitting behind you or spilling beer on the, 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 the woman in front of you. There was none of that. Sports at its best is a shared experience. It, it's a fabric that connects us as a, as a community. We lost that connection. I mean, I want to be at Dodger Stadium on opening day when the fans can finally say thank you to the players and the players can finally say thank you to the fans. The roar, there's going to be 11,000 people there, but the roar will be unbelievable. How do you think it affected the players and do you think the players now have a different view of fans where maybe before they viewed them a little bit of oh, as annoyance great, that now they think of them differently point. that's a great point this whole pandemic in sports proved the MVP the most valuable player in any game on any event is the fan the players miss them terribly ask the Lakers right now what it's like to play a home game it's a nightmare over the Staples Center it's so loud and quiet. They can't get their own energy. They have a worse record at home than they do on the road. The fans, we, I don't think we had any idea, and the players had no idea, I had no idea, how much the fans are not only part of the experience, but the experience itself.
not only do I think the players get stand ovations from the fans, the fans should get and probably will get ovations from the players. I can see the players turning into the, into the seats and clapping because they miss them terribly. Do you think we as a society now think of sports differently? We realize sports now is bigger than sports. It's not about balls and strikes or free throws or shooting percentage or final scores or even championships. It's about coming together as a community to share a passion. Up next, we continue our conversation with Bill Plaschke. We'll talk about how sports has gotten increasingly political. Plus, we will get his picks for the biggest games ahead. Stay with us. More of The Issue is. An inability of our uh, representatives in government of doing anything about it. Golden State Warriors coach Steve Kerr weighing in on the recent mass shootings in America. Kerr, so many of California's top athletes have become increasingly vocal about their political views in recent years. We're back with LA Times sports columnist Bill Plaschke. Now, one of the leaders when it comes to activism is LeBron James. Here is some of what LeBron said last year. We are scared as black people in America. Black men, black women, black kids, we are, we are terrified. There, there have always been sports stars, Bill, who are political, but with social media, they can control their narrative like never before. What do you make of this moment for politics and sports? Well, I think it's a wonderful moment. It's an intersection of the two. Finally, players are no longer content to just shut up and dribble as they have been asked to do before. They are real human beings. They're asking us to look at them not as entertainers, or as cartoon characters, but as real human beings living in this real world with real families and real issues and real social justice issues. And when you hear LeBron James, the most famous, arguably the most famous athlete in the world and the most popular saying he's scared, you listen. I think the players now have a voice and they're using it and good for them. You know, there's some on the right who say they don't wanna see this much politics in sports and, and they point to the fact that ratings for the NBA are down. Do you think that this is hurting the league's bottom line? No, I think the ratings are down because everything was down during the pandemic. Because again, people couldn't connect with the teams so they did, in person, so they don't watch them on television. No, I no, I, I don't think this this is hurting hurting the sport at all. These players, it's just highlighting the fact that these players are human beings, and they, they're just asking to be treated and viewed as human beings who live among us. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And if that can, and if LeBron James can speak out and get more people to vote and open up voting centers. In fact, if you look around the country during the last election, how many NBA arenas were voting centers? Every one of them. Because of the NBA players. How many stadiums and arenas are at vaccine centers? A lot of it's because of the athletes. Okay, we, we like to do the serious stuff here, but we also like to have some fun. And while we have you, I wanna get some help, especially for people that may be heading to Vegas. So, prediction time. <laughs> All right, we want to get your picks because lots of big games coming up. So we ready? Here we go. Your prediction. Who is going to be the NCAA champ? USD. <laughs> <laughs> you really think that? I'm serious. I'm serious. They're good enough. They're loaded. People are sleeping on them. They're going to win it all. Well, as a Trojan, I love hearing that. All right, who's going to be the NBA champ? If LeBron James and Anthony Davis are healthy, it's the Lakers. <laughs> if they're healthy. So I'm going to say they're healthy. So I'm going to say the Lakers again, back to back. Okay. Who's going to be the World Series champ? Oh, there's no question. The Dodgers, <laughs> the best teams in baseball history. Well, I'm not a homer. This is just honest truth. I could live anywhere and say this. The Dodgers are the best team in baseball by far. Yeah. And, and we're a ways away from this, but who's going to be the Super Bowl champ next year when the game is in Los Angeles? Well, it's about time for and the Los Angeles team to win it, and the Rams acquired Matthew Stafford. The Rams are gonna win the Super Bowl, and I'm not just being a homer. They got the best quarterback. They have the best defense. They have the great coach. The Rams, is it gonna be a home game? The Rams are gonna win the Super Bowl. Well, based off of your picks right there, there's only one song that we can play, and our apologies to Randy people that Norman, are watching in, uh, in San Francisco and San Diego, but Randy Newman, with the fans Thank in the you. stands, this song will be playing once again at Dodger Stadium. Bill Plaschke, thank you so much. We thank love you. it. We love that. We love that I site love and we love thank this you. song. I love LA. We love it.
Well, what you need to understand, Alex, is I am so glad to be here right now. Last week on The Issue is, comedian Matthew Friend impersonated Dr. Anthony Fauci on our show. Well, next week, the real Dr. Fauci will be back as our exclusive guest right here on The Issue is. Pretty cool, huh? We end with a celebration of all-time great music. This week, the Librarian of Congress named 25 recordings as audio treasures worth preserving forever based on their cultural and historical importance in the nation's history. Among them, Janet Jackson, or Miss Jackson, if you're nasty. Jackson's album, Rhythm Nation, is being celebrated, as is an album from Ms. Patti LaBelle. <laughs> Woo! LaBelle's hit, Lady Marmalade, will be preserved forever, as will an iconic song from a frog. Someday we'll find it, the rainbow. The lovers, the dreamers, and me. That's Kermit's Rainbow Connection. This week, Kermit expressed his gratitude for the big honor. Let's end the issue is with another one of the honored performances, Louis Armstrong's When the Saints Go Marching In. I'm Alex Michelson. Thanks for watching. Old Satchmo, play us off. I went to be in that number. I went to Saints too.